Well, 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 what duo we have here? Well, it's the Microsoft Surface Duo, actually, and this is my full review. Let's check it out. First, let's acknowledge here that this is a new form factor and a different take on foldables or how we understand them today. This form factor here of a hinge takes many of the benefits that we can see of the foldable segment, but also deliver it at a more affordable price and affordable being relative. And some would argue a little more practical as well. The Galaxy Fold 2 starts at about two grand, while the Surface Duo here starts at around $1,400, $1,400. And the main differentiating factor is it, well, it's party trick on how it does its take on foldables. This hinge here, it's a little less of a foldable, but more of a, a device with two screens. Sounds pretty bonkers, right? Well, that's why we're here. Let's start off first with design. I gotta say, this is probably the best part of the device in my opinion, and that could be a polarizing stance apparently. The Surface Duo to me, both looks and feels super premium and has the right aesthetics going for it. The combination of white enclosed in glass while at the same time accented by its silver hinge just checks off all the right boxes. Also, the prominently placed reflective Microsoft logo looks really clean. It's definitely unique and I hope Microsoft continues in this design aesthetic. Now in hand, it's actually pretty light and when you open it up, that larger surface area, when you divide out the weight into the surface area, it's super duper light. The official weight of the device is officially 250 grams, or for my fellow Americans out there, it's around the weight of a standard hamster. Now focusing on the body itself, on the right side we have from top to bottom the volume rocker, power button, and underneath that in a recessed area we have a fingerprint reader. On to I.O. This is really simple. One USB-C port right in the bottom. No headphone jack anywhere to be found, but I'm going to give this a slight pass because it's really thin. I don't think there would have been room anyways. So you want to privately listen to your jams, you're going to have to use a dongle or live that Bluetooth life. When we actually open up the device, we're greeted by two beautiful 5.6 inch 1800 by 1350 AMOLED displays, measuring at 401 pixels per inch. When you measure both screens as one, you get a 2700 by 1800 display, bringing the total screen real estate to 8.1 inches, minus the hinge of course. The phone, as you can tell, is pretty wide, so this runs counter to the industry trend of slimmer, taller devices. Also, we're fast on the left display, and that upper segment there, squeezed in between the bezel, is its one mono-firing speaker. The earpiece is not an amplified speaker at all, so it's just one, no stereo sound. Bezels-wise, it's a bit of a mixed bag here. Using tablet design philosophy, the side bezels make sense. We need room to rest the device into our palms without accidentally triggering the screen. But the top and bottom bezels seem way too big, honestly. Now, the displays themselves have 100% support on both the sRGB color gamut and the DCI P3 wide color gamut. What it means for everyday use is that it looks freaking beautiful and supports all the colors. Surprisingly, out of the box, it actually ships with vivid mode on, which I found too far saturated. So naturally, I turned it off, and even with it off, it looks really sweet. I like it. And I think you'll like it too. Give it a try. When we look into specifications, the Surface Duo is shipping with Qualcomm Snapdragon 855 processor, which was last year's flagship processor for the company. And in a few months, it will officially be two years old. More on that later in my daily usage, a bit further in the video. It also comes with six gigs of RAM on all SKUs, 128 gigs or 256 gigs of storage. I have the 128 variant and one 11 megapixel camera. Oh, and also a 3577 milliamp hour battery. You may have noticed that in the spec rundown, I said only one 11 megapixel camera. That's because this only needs one. At least that's what Microsoft contends with. Given the fact that it can fold in any orientation, that would turn it into a selfie camera or a rear firing shooter, depending how you want it. Now onto the pictures themselves, we can see that in my favorite subject, the image seems very muted in color. And oftentimes what I saw on the screen doesn't match up post picture. The color overall is lackluster in range and it has a large amount of softness in it. The geese here they were trying to run away from me lose a lot of detail and does a terrible job of capturing the grass and reproducing the gradient shift between dead grass and alive grass. This feels kind of like bullying at this point, but when compared to an iPhone 11, there's almost no contest. And I'm 100% certain that any Pixel device, maybe even the Pixel 1, but definitely any Pixel 2 and, and later, would just blow this out of the water. Notice how we lose detail in the blacks of the doggo's face. It gets soft and blends in like a watercolor painting as opposed to maintaining more detail in this photo. This effect can also be noticed in the pink of the tongue. It's just blah. There's no night mode of any sort, so here's a low light image. It's pretty sad. Now onto my day-to-day -day usage, and I gotta say, I'm actually pretty conflicted on this because 
if I had to break it down, I really enjoyed using this like 90% of the time, but there was just that 10% that it wasn't like I was mildly discontent. I was legitimately frustrated with the Surface Duo. Before we hash out the bad, let's talk about the good first. And what I can say is the phone feels snappy and it's responsive. Just because it uses last year's 855 processor and it's potentially going to be, if you watch this in a few months, two years ago 855 processor, it doesn't feel like a slouch. It can handle everything I throw at it and my daily routines, as some of you may know by now, consist of reading a lot of news. I mean, there's been a lot of news lately, so inside, outside the house, I, I have enough of it to read. Um, YouTube, media, streaming, consumption of sorts, diving through memes, sifting through the bad ones, looking for the good ones to share with friends, as well as light documentation editing, like um, for schoolwork, for example, off of call platforms, let it be Google Drive or iCall Drive. The device itself, the displays get pretty bright. There are no specifications anywhere I could find officially from Microsoft, which I found pretty weird, but according to, I, I think Tom's hardware is where I saw it from, they measured at around 600, 660 nits of brightness, which, it's fine for outdoor viewing. And I think from seeing in my room, it's also pretty fine for viewing indoors. So if you were to use this in a lecture hall or an office cubicle, you'll be good. But in bright sunlit environments, you'll still get washed out. And here, one of my most terrific use cases is one that I find myself using like every night when I'm at home. Using YouTube on the left screen and having a web browser open the other was like the move. Anyone who uses two monitors on their desk would understand the pros here. And that's really how you should be seeing this device, honestly as two separate displays. Using two fully fledged applications just makes a lot of sense on this, especially when you have that hard life limiting factor of the hinge. You could actually use an app and span across the entire display, but it's pretty awkward. Here's how it looks with games and here's how it looks with YouTube. I don't like it, I don't think you guys would either. Also, you could launch the apps in unison by pairing them together into groups, which I found pretty nifty. Microsoft makes it easy and intuitive to do, which is really appreciative. As you can see here, I have some of my groupings and one of my favorite actually that I found myself using more often than not was Yelp slash notes. So I use Yelp to look up for a restaurant, look at their menu and I write down notes. Instead of having to switch between apps, this is pretty cool. Now, yes, speaking of optimization, I don't know if you guys picked this up yet, but in the shots that you guys seen, I used a lot of Microsoft apps. Well, to me, I consider it a lot. I don't like using Edge, but I had to use Edge in this case because Microsoft pre-optimize all their apps for this product. And when you first launch up OneNote or Outlook, it really does take advantage of spanning across the entire display, all 8.1 inches of two screens. But as I mentioned earlier, you really shouldn't be using this as a big 8.1 inch screen. You should be using this two screens. So I threw Microsoft's apps to the waste bin and I downloaded Google's apps, which run really good on one screen. But when you use it across the one big screen, they look kind of funky. Also, I don't know if I explained this, but I had to use Edge because um, Chrome and Firefox are pretty buggy when you're trying to switch the apps around to various different windows and having it reorientate itself when you move the phone around because it has to do that automatically on itself. I was getting either unresponsive apps and I narrowed it down to it just being the app or erratic responses. Now onto the speakers. It isn't loud enough to fill a large room, but it is definitely loud enough to fill a medium-sized room. The quality of the speaker itself being mono isn't that great to begin with, but the sound it outputs is not rich in detail and doesn't have any sharp bass. Now for my famous test that I like to report back to you guys, the dishes test, you can still hear your media relatively well when you're clanking the dishes around and moving things here and there. But one neat little party trick is that you can actually prop up the device. I call it in sideways tent mode, like so, and have your media playing at you like this. That's pretty cool. One big issue though is when you have this on your windowsill, right? Or whatever you have in front of your face when you're doing dishes, you are putting a whole display on the floor. And honestly, that's not something I'm comfortable doing. So I actually always placed a paper towel there. Funny enough to mention, I actually didn't notice myself being more productive with this device at all. And I think that's an angle that Microsoft was trying to push here. The ability to be more productive and having two screens because even though having two monitors or a desk does translate to more productivity, in my opinion, on a phone, that doesn't quite translate well. Yes, you could have an email app running on one display and then you have a video playing here and instead of stopping your video, just respond. But was it really taking that much longer to close out an app and then swap over to email? I don't think so personally and I'm not really losing that much time nor sleep. If anything, this device has actually been more distracting because I think I can do more work on it 
while you know being able to text or look at other things but as we know humans aren't great multitaskers when we convince ourselves that we can multitask we end up doing both jobs slightly worse now in the battery department i'm happy to report to you guys that i was happily surprised even though this only ships with roughly 3500 milliamp hours it lasted pretty much all day sometimes even a day and a half now never two but even just a day and a half is really great for the size of battery I remember there were times where I'm using this near full brightness, both displays, reading and streaming stuff. I don't know how Microsoft did it, but this is a really nice long lasting device. And the standby time is excellent. Almost, no, it probably is. It's like Apple's level of standby time where you can just put it away. If you have some charge left, wake up in the morning and still have pretty much the same charge. If I go to sleep with 40, I'll wake up with maybe 39. And then as I do my routines, I just plug it into the quick charger. And then when I'm done with my whole routines, it's fully ready to go. Also, I think I forgot to mention this, but there is a charger in the box and a USB-C cable because that's expected from manufacturers. Apple. No wireless charging, but who cares about that? Sorry. Now onto the bed, and there's primarily three. First and foremost, this is definitely not a one-hand device. As you can see here, I'm having trouble even gripping it in its more favorable one handheld mode. Just based off how the fold is designed and how it has the screens internally, when you take it out, it almost is like it implies, it communicates to you that it must be used with two hands. And even to get it into one handed mode, like normal here, you still need both hands to push it all around. Now the weird thing about this slight obstacle is that I actually use this phone less overall because I didn't want to take it out and open it up. So if you're looking for some kind of mental reinforcement to stop using your phone as often, this actually could end up being a pro for some. Aside from that, as I mentioned earlier, and I guess I'll say it again, the phone's a little too wide. My thumb can go about almost half, a little past half, but I can't reach this fourth column of apps here. I can barely reach maps. Yeah, yeah I could reach it, but barely. So with my very methodical scientific analysis, this is, this is not going to fit in a woman's pants at all. Secondly, using the camera is a bit of a turkey shoot here. I mean, bring up the camera app and then getting it to reorient to the right posture or the right mode, it ends up taking at least two to three seconds each and every time. And that's if you do it perfectly. If you're the kind of person that needs to capture precious moments like lifelong memories of your children growing up or those funny shots of your friend falling down the stairs, you're gonna miss the shot of this phone here. And if you don't wanna miss the shot, you know, things that have less than a second of opportune moment, don't get this. Get a phone that you can quickly switch between the front and back camera and not have to reorient the camera as front or back. Camera. It's on me. Turn it around. Focusing, hey, it's on you guys now. Yeah, that still took too long. And last point, and admittedly, this was rare. That's why I put on last but it had a gargantuan effect if it were to continue. It's that sometimes, and again, this is a rare sometimes, one entire display would actually stop responding. And in order to get it to work again, I'd actually have to close the device, wait a bit, sometimes 15 to 30 seconds, and open it up again, and it'd work. Now, exceedingly rare, both displays wouldn't work. And what I'd have to do is actually restart the device because it's not responding to any touch input at all. And when you have to do that, and it happened, I think, at least two times. That's not something that should be on a product that costs $1,399. It needs to be more polished and fine-tuned. And those kind of glitches just can't happen. Again, to reiterate a point I made a while ago, the phone is snappy, it's smooth, but it comes to complete roadblock here when the display literally doesn't work. Now, all the gripes I just gave to you, except for the first one, are software issues, and they theoretically could be fixed moving forward. But like a bad relationship sometimes you gotta know when to walk away and you can't just be swayed by the promise of it getting better in the future and this we have to walk away but like a bad breakup we can look at it from afar on instagram we can instagram stalk to surface zero honestly this is a really good first gen attempt in my opinion a lot of the issues that i've read in reviews before writing this one were actually fixed on the day one patch there were just so many issues there's still some left so that's the thing. This device does not exist in a vacuum. I think there are comparative I think there are comparatively better options out there still. But as I mentioned, just keep your eye on this and we'll watch how it goes together. 
I really hope Microsoft continues to work on the Microsoft Surface Duo and maybe even make more phones running Android because I like this aesthetic. Let's see it on a single handheld device. Instead of the Microsoft Surface Duo, it will be the Microsoft Surface Solo? But anyways, the whole point of this was bigger picture, bigger picture here. Don't get this, but look at it, I suppose. Just want to put this out there. I'm a fan of foldables, and I hope that someday, no, I think that someday we're all going to get foldables because it makes sense to have something between the size of a phone and then span up to a tablet that we can take in our leisure time or when you're waiting in public transit. It's just so much easier. Well, until we reach that moment, this hinge here is pretty cool. Um, I saw this in a comment somewhere, and I forget what I was reading, but someone who was much funnier than me called the people who worked on this hingeers. So if anything, take that away from this video. All right, guys, thanks for watching. Let me know what you guys think about the Surface Duo and whether or not you'd actually buy one, or if you're a fan of foldables in general. Do you think they'll succeed? Do you think I'm wrong? See you guys in the next one. Peace. Survive.